Hello, everybody. I am so excited because I have both of my friends. I feel like everybody I film with now, that's been the beautiful part of this journey is like every single person I film with now are actually my friends. Like you're not just <laughs> people I like collaborate with. Like these are actually my friends. And Cindy is someone that lives right down the street. I, I tell you guys, I knew Cindy long before I even thought about putting myself up on YouTube and um, both Emmy and Emmy and Cindy both have their YouTube channels. I will be putting their links down in the description box below because if you've been living under a rock and you haven't heard of these beautiful ladies, um, go and make sure you subscribe to both of their channels. Um, they're both very, uh, I was just laughing before we started uh, filming about all the mystery schools and the priestess of ISS. And I was like, maybe the band's getting back together. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this life, instead of edging things in stone, I think Emmy and I joked about that once technology is so hard because last time we were here, we were writing things on papyruses and stones. So. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, what is this sorcery of technology? But I am, how are you ladies doing today? I always forget to ask that because we've already been chit chatting today. So <laughs> how are y'all doing? I'm good. I just finished teaching a class a little while ago. So I've been hanging out here at the studio, getting ready for the call, doing some stuff in the front room. And um, yeah, but everything's going good. New, how's the new year treating you? Oh, fantastic. What about you, Emmy? I mean, it's crazy because we got some crazy, um, the Cosmos are having a hell of a party right now. Oh, man. Yeah, <laughs> there there is some... There's a lot of energies that are kind of highlighting internal things. A lot of old stuff is coming up for a lot of people. And I mean, Capricorn season is a great time to take a look at your life anyway and see what needs to go and what needs to stay. So I kind of been doing that um, myself. And with all of the uh, solar weather going on, I have had a lot of anxiety. It's it's different than anxiety from an issue that you need to work through. It's like this really, it, it feels like for me, it feels like I drank five pots of coffee in my mm -hmm. chest area. It's just, it just feels, feels strange. Nervous but, energy, but you don't know why you're nervous. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm just trying to get back in the groove of things with homeschooling after a break and all the things. <laughs> I, I I took on a new sponsee um, in my recovery program, so um, I'm helping out a beginner, and that's always such a blessing because it really helps to remind me of where I came from and where I was and how much um, my program has helped me. And, you know, I, I realize that not everybody resonates with 12-step, but it saved my life. It saved my life, and... I definitely want to keep giving back in that area. So just trying to get into the groove after the holidays is plus these these energies. It's been a little hard. <laughs> well, I was about to say, maybe saying the cosmos are having a party is the wrong analogy. Maybe the cosmos are just hungover right now. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, you know, some of us uh, might be going through a recalibrating too. I was having this, you know, and we go through those processes often and frequently where uh, if you up level or you upgrade then or you're asking and you know that's a big thing with this time of year too especially new years people go in with their with their goals or their resolutions or whatever you want to call it in other words they're they're like okay i'm ready i'm ready for this this uh this you know an up leveling of myself and what does that look like and then it starts to happen you know then things start to happen and move and then suddenly you're like oh well wait a minute I didn't want to have to do that to up level and to upgrade. Do you mean I have to look at this or I have to release that or I have to change my habits? I have to change my lifestyle. It's like, you know, the reality of what it takes to actually, you know, go through those, 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 um, those uh, up leveling processes. And, uh, and it's not always, it's not, you know, always easy. We, we, we talked about that several times, you know, it's not always going to ask you to do the easiest thing. And, and then uh, the purging or the things begin to happen. And then your body has to recalibrate to the, the newer energies or the bigger energies that become available to you. And then that's just, then that just becomes like a constant process. It's like you grow and then like you have to recalibrate and then you kind of pull in and then you grow. And so we're always 
going through this pulsing, this expanding and contracting, spiraling process to um, to, to to help us, you know, on our, our journey of, of growth and awakening and, you know, becoming who we're becoming and, um, you know, knowing our truest self, our highest self, all that good stuff. It's like the more and that's and that's and I think we've we talked about this a lot, Cindy, off camera, you see this a lot in the yoga world. And we'll get into the topic at hand soon, guys, but this does have to do with the topic at hand, where people want to change. But the minute things start to happen because of the change, and it's it's oftentimes it's a shit show. Um, things start to fall apart. It's kind of like that a Kali, you know, Mother Kali who comes in. She's um, you know, uh, very forced to be reckoned with in the in the pantheon from the Hindu mythology, and she she's very. She's like Ganesh on steroids. You know, Ganesh is the remover of obstacles, but he does it in a very playful way. Kali comes in and chops heads off. You know, literally, she holds the heads up. Like, and so it's, you go through these seasons where it's like the more you want that spiritual change, the expect your life to fall apart. But it's mm -hmm. only falling apart because it has to. It, you can't keep the same patterns and mm -hmm. also have new patterns and a lot of people will come mm -hmm. into the yoga world and will want that change and i think emmy we were actually talking about this yesterday as well off, off camera on, on the phone people will come into the, the yoga world and they'll want but the minute that they turn around and run because sometimes the the depression the sadness that you know is more comforting than the newness the mm -hmm. unknown once you get through that destruction Right. And so people will then clean back and it's this, this, um, but you know, it's, it's definitely, you know, us, there's a great meme and I'm kind of going to paraphrase it. I think maybe people have shared it in the signal support group, but it's like what I thought a spiritual transformation would look like. And it's like she raw with yeah. light coming out and beautiful flowing hair with a sword. And then what it really looks like. And it's like messy hair, cigarette hanging out of your mouth, like stained clothes dark circles crying marks like <laughs> what it really mm -hmm. looks like you know and that's why they call it that's why the shadow work is so important and, and um you know i was laughing off camera cindy i've heard you say many times and guys just so you know i never look this good after i finished teaching so back then cindy looks like a supermodel yeah. after she's yeah done right teaching is amazing but um i mm -hmm. never looked this good after i finished teaching but um but uh it's it it's, as Cindy say I I like to play in the shadows. The shadow side is is that that side of you that's icky, you know that that it's your shadow. It's it's but it's it's the most transformative, and that's what we're doing. We did the thirty day shadow work challenge back in November, and now we have this huge. 60 day which 60 days is a long time as i've been making this template it's a long time and i'm really excited to see what comes of it and it's it's interesting because i actually without even thinking about it i merged emmy's grief work with cindy's work together in the in the template and it just so happened that emmy could hop on today and i was like oh my god this is like divine because um because we're going to talk a little bit about what cindy does and how it it kind of intertwines with what emmy does because um they are both reiki reiki people and are both healers and as you know every healer and i think you ladies can attest to this every healer in every lineage is going to do things a little bit differently right because mm -hmm. You have your own autonomy. You That's why it's really important. I think sometimes in our world today, we have this view that you can become a healer overnight. And that's not necessarily where we all have the ability to do it. But there's a huge learning and you're, you're constantly learning. You're constantly evolving in your in your craft because you have to do you first. Like, right. You have to heal yourself to an extent first before and and learning from others and evolving and finding kind of your own um, your own autonomy in what you do and, and it's that personal experience that kind of comes through with your healing as well and um and so so let's go ahead let's start cindy you so i've i've the only yoga we did in the 30-day channel ch uh, channel challenge was ashtanga but what we're doing in this challenge is we are going to be doing ashtanga as well but we're incorporating Cindy's and what Cindy does she studied on on Yusara, which is an offshoot of Iyengar yoga but Cindy's kind of unique as as I see her as such a healer in the way that she works the modality of the body. 
within her her teaching too and so cindy where do you want to start and then we'll incorporate emmy's grief stuff and emmy just pipe in if you want to touch on something that's being said well i know we've talked about before bryce how uh and and it's 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 in the it's in a lot of the the philosophies and even i think in the yoga scriptures and all that i mean you're you're in anything that you read about to the energies and the energetic body is that your mind or your, excuse me your body is just like this reflection of, of what's going on um on the inside of you and that your body responds to every thought that you're having like literally your body responds to every single thought that you're having and, you know, yoga is, it, it, it hits both of that, both of those things. It hits your mind. It works your mind. It works your body. And of course, it works the energies, the energies at play between the two. And when we begin to uh, understand that our body is an image, a reflection of that, then that you can start to see where the potentials are for healing within your body, but then how that also takes you deeper within the energetics and the mental aspects. So in other words, you can go through the body to get to the mind and your belief patterns and vice versa. Like you can go through the mind to get to your body and understanding that that arrow goes both ways. Yeah. So, you know, if there are times where you're where you're feeling sad or you're feeling depressed or you're feeling um, underwhelmed, you know, and, and, and your body will automatically respond to that. You know that. So if you're feeling uh, deflated or depressed or sad your body does something like this. It, it will literally deflate. You will become smaller, your belly, you, you lose your abdominals because your belly, if you know, your abdominals is the source of your source of power and feeling confident. So if you're feeling the opposite of confident, you're feeling deflated, your body will show that and it will, it will become small. You know, your shoulders will hunch over, your head will come forward and you'll, you'll lose the tone in your stomach. And then if you know that and you're like, okay, well, this is the way I'm feeling right now. What can I do to make myself feel better? Well, I'm going to re-engage my abdominals. I'm going to sit up tall. I'm going to open up my heart. I'm going to lengthen through my neck, reach to the crown of my head and take up more room. And just the process of doing that, opening up yourself and taking up more room will probably make you feel just a little bit better. Because your your um, the you know the chemistry within your body is feeding the thoughts in your brain. So in other words, you move your body a certain way, then that tells your mind, oh, okay, I think we're feeling better now, and so you get better thoughts, right? So it's really understanding that connection with how. Uh, your body does respond to every thought that you're having and that that arrow works both ways. When you understand that, then you can understand how like a yoga practice or movement practice is so important to our health and well-being because it will actually help you in uh, managing your moods and uh, in, in starting to break through some of the conditionings that we've put on ourselves, not just mentally, but physically. It's like it all works as a unit. And when we treat it as so, then the, the results that you will get, will it'll be longer lasting, it'll be quicker, and then you'll know what to do to support yourself when you do have like a bad day, you know, when you're not feeling good. Well, how can I move my body to... Um, to to help reflect a different mood you know to allow in and invite something that feels better to me and that's and i think that that's a big that that's a big uh component of understanding you understand that that connection i mean that's how the healer as, as a healer that's how i i work i work through the body to get to the different layers of you and the mind will lie to you. I mean, how the three of us, and actually, uh, uh, Cindy, Emmy just started practicing Ashtanga yoga. She's been doing, and I know she's had a lot of uh, re revelations and breakthroughs just doing a yoga practice consistently. And something, too, another layer to that is, like, the mind is really good at lying to you. You will lie to yourself a lot for your sense of survival. 
And, but the body doesn't, the body keeps the score. That's the big, big book, right? The big heavy book is the body mm-hmm. keeps the score. And so there is this, like, it's interesting because the yoga sutras talk about this. We have Prakriti, which is the body, which is nature and Purusha, which is the soul. Prakriti, the nature is going to die one day, but the soul is eternal. However, the soul really cannot exist without the expression of the body. And so what it does is it then goes into another incarnation. And it's always this constant, it's like the never ending tango, you know, or what's a more dramatic dance? The uh, Paso Doble, is that a more dramatic dance? I would say yes. it's, it's never just like the jitterbug. It's like a Paso Doble. It's like, dun, dun, dun. like, it's always this like telenovela of your life, you know? And so sometimes, and I know um, Emmy can also speak on, I know we all can speak on this. You'll have issues. You notice if you if you do a, a mobility practice like yoga, which is yoga was designed specifically, literally for shadow work. That's not what they call it in the yoga sutras. That's more of a a, a, a common uh, modern term. But literally, that's what the asana was designed for: was to open up energy pathways to show you where there are blockages, right? And so, but any exercise can be used in that modality too. But there have been times I think where um, at least I know for me where I'll have an issue with like my hip and all of a sudden it, I don't want to say it opens up Pandora's box because that's not it at all because you're able to Pandora's box was chaos, but you're able to kind of, you feel chaotic, but you're able to then kind of work through it where, where opportunities are presented. It's like the practice. And I'm sure you get this a lot with Reiki too, where something is presented to the person as something they might not even be consciously aware of. That's mm-hmm. creating a pattern within their life that their body is showing them. And, mm-hmm. and it's tough. It's rough. It's not, it's not like, oh, goody, goody gun drops. I get to work on this daddy issue. You know, it's not, it's like, oh shit. Like, <laughs> it's like, da, da, da. Um, you know, but um, I don't know if Emmy, if you want to, cause I know you were doing Reiki before you started doing yoga. So did you notice a difference from what Cindy is saying with, um, with uh, the experience of the using the body? Yes. Um, I've done quite a bit of work um, in on my own with Reiki, with self-Reiki, and then working in my Reiki groups and also in my 12-step groups. I've done a lot of work um, with ego. And um, it's amazing how sneaky it can get. Um Practicing yoga has brought up a lot of additional stuff. And when I say sneaky, um, the ego will, as it's dying, the ego will very craftily and sneakily um, place thoughts to get you to attach to something. And I just notice the thought patterns. And when I realize, oh, that's, that's ego, it'll go to an even more subtle thought pattern. And when I find myself, like, for example, this morning, I woke up and um, I wanted to do my practice right away because I had to be to work by six o'clock in the morning. Um, And immediately, as soon as I woke up, my mind just was going to these really, really disturbing thoughts. And it was alarming me. And I was like, like you were saying, Cindy, how your body responds to every thought. Well, I just had this anxiety well up and I was like, um, oh, I don't want to practice. Like I just, I need to deal with these feelings. And I'm like, oh, oh, you sneaky devil. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, it, it, like- well, there's the, the whole chemistry that goes on too. So, you know, you have a thought. So you woke up with the, with the disturbing thoughts and yes, your body is going to respond. It's going to re- respond by, you know, your endocrine system responds by then shooting off like cortisol and all these, uh, uh, these stress producing hormones because that thought is telling your body that there's some kind of danger going on here. It's not, it's not, it's not good right now your your thought is producing like this situation where it feels like there's something wrong there's danger and so then your body the chem- the chemistry of your body the chemicals you know the hormonal system your endocrine system will start to spill all those 
those uh, stress hormones out. And then that stress hormone, those stress hormones create that feeling of anxiety in your body. And then that anxiety in your body then goes in and feeds your mind again saying, oh, there really is something wrong. And then it creates like that, that looping, a spiraling into that. And yeah, and when it, you can realize that that's happening and you're like, oh, well, I'm actually not in danger, am I? Like, I'm not actually being chased by a bear or dinosaurs or, you know, the world isn't, my house isn't on fire. I'm not, I'm not, someone's not here uh, standing in front of me with a gun pointed to my head. I am simply creating the situation in my head. Like, I just made up this story. And that's the crazy thing. It's like, shit, my body is responding to a story that's not even happening. It's like, it's not even true. And then when you have that realization, you're like, okay. And yes, hopefully you can pull yourself out enough to to do the work, then to like, you know, then you move the body and then you can re-regulate your hormonal system, which then can regulate your nervous system. Your nervous system can finally go, okay, I'm okay now. But yeah, like that process that that the like really understanding it helps me a lot to understand the actual mechanics of my body and how my body responds to the thoughts and how that anxiety feeds more like you understand that looping and you can feel when it's starting to happen, then that you can realize, wow, you know, I'm I'm kind of being ridiculous here with my thinking patterns. Because I'm, at, you know, I'm sitting here. I'm in my bedroom, in my pajamas. There's nothing wrong. I'm not being attacked. I'm like perfectly okay right now. I'm safe. I'm I have healthy. plenty of food in my stomach. There's nothing like really. There's nothing going on. It's just a story in my head. Yeah. You know. And then it's like, wow, how much we are impacted by the stories that we create in our heads. And so then yoga helps to, or whatever, like the movement, whatever you chose to do, it helps to disrupt that, helps to disrupt those stories. So you won't, we don't buy into them so much. We don't believe them so much. So as Bryce was saying, you, you, you shouldn't believe everything that you think. <laughs> yeah. Because most of the stuff that we think is not true. Most yeah. of the things we, we think are just elaborate stories that we make up in our minds that aren't even happening. And we stress ourselves out over it. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. One of my favorite things that um, my sponsors told me, one of the favorite things she tells me all the time is she's like, Emmy, don't go into your head alone. It's haunted. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. Listen, haunted house has got nothing on this head. Like, I'll go through them. <laughs> Totally, one hundred percent. Be like, no, and it, and it gets the, and it gets all of us. It gets the best of us, even the ones who've been doing the work for a long time. I mean, it gets all of us. And that's something Ram Das. I can't remember which book he spoke about this in. That when you're r- coming right up to a breakthrough, uh, emotionally, mentally, that's when the ego gets the worst. Like it comes for like in like a lion. And so, if people are wondering if you're new to this, what we're talking about, so like. When you're going through the ego or the false sense of self, there is a necessary component to the ego. Like there is a a proper place for it, mostly to offer resistance, but there is a proper place for it. But um, that is the false sense of self. And so if we look at like what Patanjali is saying in the Yoga Sutras, basically he says we're all batshit crazy you know? <laughs> that we because we believe what we think and we think that who we are in our identity in this existence is who we are eternally. But because it's not permanent, it's not who we are eternally. And the more you can understand that. The, literally, the more peaceful your life becomes, the more comical your life kind of becomes, too, because it's all temporary. This, too, shall pass. But what happens is because the ego is the side of your mortality, is that the more you get closer to that little nugget of eternal truth, the ego starts to go, oh, hell no, you're not putting me away. Mm-hmm. You know, and so it, it, and so for me, like I was a bad lady this morning, as my teacher would say, oh, a bad lady. Um, my David Grieg actually has a, uh, a CD. He does these chantings on CD, my original teacher, and he calls it bad, bad man bhakti, because that's what they would say, bad lady or bad man. If you, um, I woke up early and usually what I do before I start my practice is I'll piddle around for a little bit and you know, wake myself up, change the toilet paper, 
usually me making excuses not to do my practice. It's usually what it is, but I'll eventually uh-huh. do it. But I started watching a reality show called um, Special Forces. And and it's so crazy. I'll give you guys, because this reality show, they literally take a bunch of celebrities and they put them through Marine training. So it's, it's like it's like shadow work on steroids. And I watched the whole hour and a half first episode and I kept thinking, this, I was like, this is shadow work I want to do. I want to do this shadow work. Meanwhile, I hadn't even gotten on my mat. And then the next thing I realized, I had to film with Shanti. I got to go take a shower. So do you see how artfully clever my ego was this morning? Mm-hmm. It had me watching a reality show at 5 o'clock in the fucking morning about a bunch of celebrities doing Marine training, me thinking, now this is the shadow work I want to do when my literal mat was sitting right there waiting for me to practice on it. Right. And while, while you're avoiding your own in the in the whole right. process, right? It's like, it's much more fun watching other people do theirs and having to do your own. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I'm them. like snacking on them. Let me see them do like, it. oh, look at Mel B from the this Spice Girls. This better. You know, and I was getting emotional watching them. I was like, this is fantastic. And I'm like, my mat's just sitting there empty. And so that, I mean, and I've been doing this. I'm coming up on my 17th year this February. Like, I've, so you you never outgrow this. Like, this is never, you never outgrow your training pants. Like, you <laughs> No, I mean, I think, you know, we also have to remember not to take any of this so seriously. Because right. when you start you know, uh, diving into the realms of the, the shadows and stuff. It's not so that you can stay there. I mean, you right. shouldn't stay there. Right. You go in there to sh- shine the light of consciousness, your consciousness, your awareness, that is the light, right? And so we just want to bring the shadow to light to our consciousness and do the work and then and then come back up, you know, come back up and and live life and live in joy and live happily and, you know, do the things that bring us joy and be with the people that we love. And, you know, that's what life is about. Life isn't just about doing the shadow work because then that would be miserable and it would suck. Right. You do the work so that you could be free. You do the work. You go in. Don't stay there. Don't linger there. There's no need for that. Stay in there long enough. Because because then we can be, you know, because that's another way the ego can wrap itself around things. So you're talking about how the ego sneaks in and it wraps itself. I mean, it it, it can bring it, it, it wraps and brings in its like its little tentacles into all aspects of our lives. And it can bring it into your work, into yeah. like your healing, into your shadow by going in there and getting all caught up in the drama and saying, oh, you know, the shadow, it's all like ooey and goo. And I don't know. It's just there's something. And and then you get all caught up in the drama of the whole thing that you forget that that's not where you're supposed to stay. Right. I mean, you're there to, you know, to do to do the things so that when you come back to the uh, to the surface, when you like when you come back up, when you ascend. So, you know, I, I think of. Uh, delving into the shadows is more of a descending process, but you descend to ascend, you yeah. know, you descend and then when you come back up and you breathe and you can uh, bring more of yourself to the table and living your life so that your life can be more full, more free and a happier. And in the end, that's what you want. You don't just want to stay in the ucky mucky mess. You want to realize that there's something um, worth it on the other side. Yeah. yeah, it's I, I like the analogy of a spiral, you know, an ascension spiral, you know, because you, you yeah, come around, where... you go into the shadows, you do some work, there it is. you come out of it, and you have peeled back another layer and more of your authentic self are is coming through. And then you come back around and you do some more shadow work. And then you come out of it and another layer is peeled back. And, and the more work you do and the higher you go, the more and more of yourself is revealed to you. And mm-hmm. it's a beautiful process. But I tell you what, it's really, really hard. It's really hard being in the contraction phase. <laughs> it is. And, you know, the willingness, people are willing to change. But what we really need willingness is to go through the shit. Are you willing to be miserable? 
temporarily? Are you willing to be uncomfortable? Are you willing to feel the really hard feelings? Are you willing to look at yourself and be honest and be humble about the things that you need to work on? That's what we need to be willing to do. You know, we're all willing to change. It's being willing to to go through the muck and 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 see it through and be consistent enough to come to the other side. It, it's it's challenging. It is challenging. Mm-hmm. I've, I've I've started and ran the other way a bunch of times. <laughs> it's a whole it's a whole life practice too. Like that's what I want people to understand. And and this sixty day challenge, there are going to be some new stuff we're doing, like grief. And it's interesting because talk about the heaviness. Like when you're going through the stages of grief, the anger, the depression. It literally, like if you're in a state of depression, your body literally feels heavy. There's a it feels like you were being just completely just pulled down and so it's beautiful that i've incorporated cindy's practices especially with the hips and the heart while you're going to be focusing on like the depression the anger the grief of of these emotions that we all we i don't know anybody who goes through this world and doesn't ever experience grief you Mm -hmm. know it's it's so it's 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 um as my teacher and one of my teachers in high school would say no one gets out of this world alive like no one gets out of this world alive. We all have our, our own stuff. And that's also, but speaking of the underworld, I've been studying a lot about, I, I cover the Elysian mysteries. I'm building up to the priestess of Isis, all these old mystery schools. And what got me really fascinated with this too was um, Trisha McCannon's book, uh, Return of the Divine Sophia, which I know Cindy has a copy of that now. She talks a lot about Ishtar and Tammuz. And for those who don't know who Ishtar and Tammuz it were or are, that's where we get the Jesus story from, too. Also Mithra, but the whole uh, crucifixion, resurrection, that kind of stuff came from Tammuz and Ishtar. And the Lent comes from that, the 40 days. He was 40 years old when he was killed. You eat the ham at Easter because that Easter comes from Ishtar, which was his other half. She goes down to the underworld to get him. It's a whole thing. It's a whole drama, you know, and um, but the whole story represents it's a metaphor of going into the underworld of yourself only to then becoming to be resurrected again, you know, and and this I know that the the Christians will have a hard time with this, but the story was around long before um, the Jesus story was around. And what was interesting is what Trisha McCannon pointed out in her book, what she got from her research is that Magdalene and Yeshua because they were of Egyptian descent of the priesthood of Isis, they would reenact Tammuz and Ishtar every year. They weren't dying. They would literally go and reenact this. It's a story. Same with the Ulyssian mysteries with Demeter and Persephone. They would reenact this because Persephone gets taken to the under. It's all, all these Greek or Egyptian stories of these ancient, 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 ancient stories were understood by on such a deeper level about you, the the aspects of you of you going into your own hell your own underworld and then being able to process through it and come back out the other side and that's what yeshua and magdalene were reenacting he was never crucified that was Tammuz, and it was a reenacted, and it wasn't about pagan worship or anything like that. Please, the word pagan was a word created by the church; it doesn't really exist. It was it was understanding this is a necessary necessary um, ritual. Uh, well, I don't know what you want to call it a necessary um, transformation that we get to do on the human path. We get to do this. And that's, I know I've said this at Sacred Garden before, because the Ashtanga practice kicks your ass every day. Like there's a reason why I put it off this morning. (laughs) For some reason, I was thinking the Marine training was so much easier than that Ashtanga practice. But, um, but, uh, so I just didn't do it. I watched the Marines instead. But um, I see that in, in Cindy's class a lot because you see people like, I see it as a teacher where I know a student could go a little bit further and the posture, but it's uncomfortable, so they don't. And so I try to get them to go a little bit further. And I'll say it's only five breaths. And you came here on purpose. And that's something I have to tell myself when I'm I'm struggling in my practice. Like you came to your mat on purpose. You're doing this on purpose. There's power there. There's power. When you make that conscious decision to say, I'm gonna face this, it's gonna suck. I'm gonna look like hell going through it but I'm doing this intentionally because it's what I came to earth to do. There's a power there. Well, you know, 
the um and this is actually part you know one of the philosophies of the you're, you're talking about anisara and how in one of the branches of the trainings of the yoga that i received one of the reasons that um i really enjoyed that beyond just the alignment of the body but their philosophy was tantric you know anusara was uh, uh, had a tantric philosophical base and that goes right in line with what you're talking about with the lucidian mysteries and everything about the descending and coming into the underworld and all that is very much about really coming into and understanding the aspects of us that are very human you know like our humanity is what brings in all those different like characters of the other side of the spectrum you know cuz you you can talk about the light side of the spectrum a lot and that's usually where we want to be right but then it, you're talking about the other side of the spectrum that has like some of those darker heavier emotions or tendencies and uh, in the the um in the, in the tantric philosophy it's uh in the in the you know and, and it's originally like a buddhist you know it starts it started in the in with with buddhism tantric buddhism but the 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 end part the end phase the outcome is the same versus classical versus tantra it's like we're all going for that sense of that higher self or enlightenment yeah. or whatever you want to call it but the in like the more classical traditional ways of the of, of the philosophy uh you're we're often taught that the body is something that gets in the way our humanity gets in the way so we must transcend our body in order to know the light well with uh, uh tantra uh the body itself prakriti you're talking about yeah. prakriti prakriti herself is divine uh -huh. so the body is divine the body is not something that you transcend nor is your humanity, but you go through your body to enlightenment. So you go through your humanity to enlightenment instead of trying to bypass it and going straight to the light. That's why Tantra is often, it's a shock. That's why it's considered a Shakti path, a, a feminine path, because it's the path of Prakriti. You know, Prakriti is the feminine aspect where Purusha is the male aspect, yeah. right? So Prakriti, you're going through Prakriti. Another word for Prakriti is Shakti. So the Prakriti, the Shakti, the feminine aspect is seen as divine, not something that's evil or that gets in your way, but we can go through the body. And so the, these female paths, right? These females uh, are the, yeah, yeah the, the female path is often considered the left-handed path. Because it is the path of going like through desire and through the things. And the left-handed path is also considered a slightly more dangerous path because it is very easy then to get caught up. It's like suddenly you're going through the body and through the desires and then we get distracted. And we go, oh, well, this is interesting. So let me go here, which is why it's considered the poison path. So the left-handed left path, the poison path, the tantric path, the female path, it's all the same because you are, you're going through and it's like, well, why do I, do, why, why choose that path? It's like, why not just choose the path of transcendence instead, like the path of the monk, or yeah. the path of the, uh, the aesthetic, you know, the, the, um, what you call it, you know, like the ones who go out in the mountains and, and uh, separate themselves from the world, right? And it's because most of us have to learn how to be with our emotions. Like we need to learn how to be with our humanity. We need to learn how to integrate that because most of us don't have the option of becoming a monk mm. or a nun. And it is, some will say, well, you know, there's a difference in opinions in this. And some will say that it is a quicker path, but well, it's, a, it's, it's quicker because there's a, a poison, like anything that's, you think of let's say ayahuasca or, or or mushrooms like plant medicines the ones that are most potent to give you change they also have a slight chance of killing you like yes. you do too much yes. ayahuasca you have a chance of death you do too yes. much mushroom like you can end up like being you know like messed up in your head yeah so potent medicine always like there is a chance there that it could like take you out and it could kill you but because of the potency, 
And if you know the dosage, you do the right dosage, then it has the chance to awaken you. And so it's kind of like the same of what we're talking about, descending the, the tantric, the female path. It's like you got to know how to do it in the right dosage. It's so funny. Which is why you need a practice. It's like you yes. need a practice that's going to anchor you constantly bringing you back to like your purpose and your goal. Otherwise, you can get totally. And then you see that. And yeah, even yeah. like if you look at the, the yoga, so like how many times have you heard of like yoga gurus who have like done bad things? Oh, I mean, our you friends know, they got them. all caught up because they forgot to anchor. It's like, yeah, so, yeah, it's like that part of the practice has to stay there to keep you focused. It is so funny you're bringing this up, uh, Cindy, because I was just yesterday, Todd and I were talking about ayahuasca. And he has done a lot of ayahuasca in his life. I know, Cindy, you've done it. Um, I I keep being called to do it. We were supposed to go to Peru to do it right before the universe said. The pen. Yeah, before mm -hmm. they shut it down. They're like, nope. So, um, but, um, you know, it's interesting because we were talking about that because Todd and myself, I think all three of us, I'm a huge supporter of plant medicine. I'm a huge supporter of, of these things, but you're right. And Todd was saying that to a student, like you can't, these like things like ayahuasca need to be taken very in a very responsible way because it can also delude you a little bit. And he said, he's seen a lot of people end up joining cults after they do a yes. they'll do multiple trips. They'll do multiple. And Todd's like, you got to, it's very important that before you take that jump into doing something like ayahuasca or peyote, um, mushrooms are not as, as intense, but, but, um, that you have, you're grounded within your own practice. You've seen your own hell a few times and you understand and you're trusting of the shaman who is administering this and under and do as they say, because I, it, it makes me so, it's so funny to me that it's still illegal in the United States. Cause it's not like ayahuasca is a party drug. It's not like you're seeing people doing ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. at the club. Like, like it is not a party. I know Cindy, it's not a party, is it? Yeah, it wasn't for me. You're like, Jeez. I did it one time and I was good. <laughs> it was like a trip to talk about a trip to the underworld, man. Mm. That was rushed. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, yeah and that's what a lot of people will tell you that it was like one of the most harrowing experiences of their life but they learned so much and they're not rushing to go back and do it again but those but sometimes the medicine can um and that's what it's called it's called a medicine sometimes it will kind of trick you and think and then you'll be depending on where your mind is and so it is super important because and, and that's what's the that's in my opinion that's kind of the beauty of it too is that it is so dangerous that it's really you have to take personal responsibility like you have mm -hmm. you have no choice but to take personal responsibility and and use discernment and critical thinking skills on yourself you know and and i think that's a lot of what what well, a lot of this work is too is is under is not being swept away with the emotions but being able to experience the emotion observe the emotion but understand again don't believe everything you think and sometimes what you're yeah. thinking is expressed in emotion well in my opinion all of the stuff the yoga the um whatever path you take you know the plant medicines what it's all doing at its essence is just simply saving you time um, so like, and I've found that when you try to speed things up, which sometimes you can, like ayahuasca is one of those things, it will just speed up the process that with speed, there's a little price to pay. <laughs> like you want to go through this faster. Okay. I'll get you there faster, but there's a cost. And that cost is going to be, you're going to you know, you're going to travel to those deep, dark places, but that's the price that you pay for, for, for the time. And I think that's something that you can, that you need to consider with your own self and with your own ability, like knowing your body and knowing your mind and knowing your nervous system. Um, speed might not be what you need. Like, mm. you know, just a nice, steady, consistent, slower path is always good you know then the, there's the ones that want to speed it up a little bit and that's when and and it's fine like 
if that's what you feel called to do, but just know that when uh, you're, you'll be tested more with the, with the things like, you know, or, or the, the, the very potent things, the very potent practices, just like, like, you know, your certain yoga practices, like I consider Ashtanga a potent medicine, yeah. which will speed things up, right? Oh, It'll speed your karma. It'll speed the process up. That's what, and that's what Harmony, my friend Harmony of Canada, who's one of the 17 women who are actually certified, meaning she's a badass. She says that, that the pra practice of Ashtanga is you're, you're asking, you're asking for it. You're asking for your karma to be sped up. Um, Ashtanga yoga, I, I, it's not very forgiving. I mean, there is place you can, you can work it. I'm not saying that you have to go now. I mean, that's one of my biggest issues that people take with Ashtanga is they think it's like has to be done. No, there's all sorts of modifications. There's all sorts of it. The, the, the amount of postures you do in your practice is dependent upon the person and where they are, but it is very, you're right. It's the way it's designed. It is like hitting you in all the right places and they feel so which wrong. is why some of the stuff will come up which is why you might start to feel all the stuff it's because the potency of the practices whether it's ashtanga whether it's plant medicine well whatever it is that you do anything that has that potency is going to bring your stuff up more quickly but within with that quickness comes an intensity and you just have to be like ready to uh to hold like to process it but you, but you're designed to, like most of us are designed to process, we're built to process difficult things. And I think that the lineage- And we're stronger, we're stronger than we think we are. We think yeah. that we can't handle it, but then in the end, it's like, oh, you know, well, I handled it. I didn't think I could and it, it hurt, died. but I did it. Okay, I, I handled it, I'm still alive. Life. I haven't seen anybody, anybody die in the mice or mute room yet, knock on wood. You know, I've seen a lot of tears. I've heard a lot of F-bombs. I always laugh, you know, and, and granted, we practice Ashtanga typically super early in the morning, like for Brahma Morto, and it's uh, the dead of night, dark 30, as we say. And you go to these um, regular yoga classes where people look really cute. They've got their cute little Lululemons on. Their hair is done nicely. You go to a Mysore room, half the people have their clothes on backwards. They have <laughs> Albert Einstein hair because it's so hot in there. They all, they all have, I love the Ashtanga face. It's all resting bitch face. Everybody looks like, you know, they're so, but it, but it's raw, you know, and, and you're right. Ashtanga is definitely, but I think, I think people are kind of called to the lineage that they need the most. And mm -hmm. it's funny to say that the last, I was actually just talking to Emmy about this. Todd and I, Todd had mentioned this, this to me today. Um, you know, it's, you talk about the, when you go to study at KPJY in India, you're kind of thrown into a circus of Prakriti. You're thrown into Mother India. And people told me that before I started going to India. They were like, you're going to find that your biggest teacher is Mother India. And mm -hmm. I didn't understand what they were talking about until I got there. And having to deal with, I knew the practice is the same practice I was doing at home, but all of the stimulants from uh, India is a very loud country. It's a very colorful country. It really stimulates your nervous system and your senses, especially if you're not used to it. And the funny thing is, is when I came after my first trip, when I came back to America, I was re-stimulated because I was so used to India. Coming back to America became another stimulant. Um, but but my last, the last time I was in India before uh, lockdown, I got very, very, very sick. I ended up, I was um, on the side, because I have a Mysore Foundation, I work with Plum Kids, but I was also rescuing these dogs. My friend Mark up in uh, up in Ohio, hi Mark, if you're listening, we were rescuing these dogs, a mo mo mother and her four puppies. And so I was going in and out of these gutters every day. Well, in India, it's customary, men sometimes will go to the bathroom, human men will go to the bathroom outside, like poop outside and nice. i had gotten human feces inside of my body and i think it was from like going in and out of the gutters and petting the dogs and maybe they had some dried uh, somehow it got in my system i was telling emmy my temperature got up to about 108 i was in the hospital i have never been in that much pain i will never forget that i was in so much 
pain and my friend Mark would come in and check on me and I I was like I my stomach was swollen but I it was coming out both ends um it was bad and at that Do you want to figure out what you got I'm just curious did you get like typhoid I, I can't I'll tell you I'll tell you a funny story about how I knew what I what happened to me but in that moment, um, I was like talking to Todd and I didn't know this until I got back to the United States that Todd actually thought I was going to die. And so he was talking to our assistant to take over the shala because he was frantically looking to book a ticket to India because he literally that's how scared he was. And I get sick all the time. I'm Vata. I get sick. But so for him to be that scared. But looking back on that experience, I think it was an upgrade. I think I had karmically had to take that in because I feel feel like I went through an upgrade at that moment. I got, after mm -hmm. I worked, well, uh, it took me about a year actually to really work through it. And so I, I'll tell you, so when I got back home, when I flew back from India, that, that trip, I was still a little sick. I wasn't as sick as I was, but I was still a little sick. And so I upgraded my tickets. I just pulled my credit card out and I upgraded my ticket to business class because I thought there is no way that I can fly halfway across the planet in coach because I, sure. I I don't know if I'm going to have diarrhea. I don't know if I'm going to throw up. And so um, I I literally laid down the whole way from uh, Bangalore to Dubai, Dubai to Boston and Boston back down to Atlanta. And so I get back to Atlanta and my mother, I wasn't quite sure what had happened to me because in India, they don't really tell you, especially if you're a female. So but mm -hmm. my mother was like, we, I need to make sure that you are okay. And so she forced me to go to the doctor and they actually took a stool sample. I know that sounds gross. And a, like a few weeks passed and I was down in Florida and my mom calls me and she says, um, for some reason, the health department has sent you a letter to our address. I don't know why they had our address, but it's from the health, the public health department. It seems it says urgent do you want me to open it? And I said, yeah, she opened it. And they wanted me to call them right away because of my test results. So here I am thinking, oh my God, I'm going to die. They're going to send me back to India. <laughs> They're going to deport me back. Yeah. To um, and so I quarantine you. I know I call this is before the lockdown guys. This is long before I called yeah. them nervous wreck. And basically it was, a, and that's when I learned that I had gotten some sickness from, and I can't remember the Latin name, the doctor used it wasn't e coli it wasn't anything i'd ever heard before but it came from a human feces and the reason why they were mm. calling me is because they needed to make sure this wasn't an outbreak in the united states that was the only reason oh my gosh. i had to check my, my travel records and i was like oh no no it's from india like i was like no 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 it's not you got some kind of rare bacterial disease from from human, human feces yeah, and that's my thing is like both Mark and I were jumping in and out of that gutter. How come I'm the one that got that in my system and not him? I think it was because I asked right. for my karma to be sped up. And that I mean, literally, when you are burning through your karma, it's it turns very physical. It turns mm -hmm. very physical. The 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 pain that the body goes through pain. Um, mm -hmm. it's it's I mean, I, I tell this story all the time. David Grieg asked Patabi Joyce once, um, Guruji is the pain in this practice necessary? And Guruji said, yes, because pain is real. It's real. Mm -hmm. And so when you're having that visceral reaction, that physical reaction to what you're experiencing, you can't, you can't spiritually bypass it. You can't, you mm -hmm. have to experience it. You can't do anything to, to, to ignore it, right? There's no, there's no getting away from it. I mean, even with my situation in India, I was asking for all the drugs. I was like, give me everything. Shoot me up. Like, do what you got to do. And I still, even with, with the painkillers, I still was not, I was like, I, I, I laid there in that hospital bed and I was crying at one point. I was, my body hurt so bad. And I've never experienced mm -hmm. that to the point where I was actually, usually I'm pretty good with sickness, but um, it was intense. And looking back at that, it, it was very dharmic. It was very much karmic and dharmic at the same time. And you're right. You are literally asking for that to happen when you pick these really, really potent paths. Um, it's well, the Ulyssian mysteries, right? They would fast them for days. And then they would send them in an underground temple that was sensory deprived. So they didn't have they had sensory deprivation and give them ayahuasca for like three mm -hmm. days. With no food. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that that underground temple probably smelled 
Mm-hmm. Well, you, and you know, they say the uh, with the Lucinian mysteries, because, you know, that was like a uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you already know this. You did a show, but, you know, it was like a considered a cult at the time. And they were very I mean, you took what happened there to 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 the to your death. You were not allowed yeah. to talk about what was happening. But, you know, what they noticed for the people who participated in that is that almost all of them, they no longer had a fear of death. That was right. like one of the big things of the Eleusinian mysteries and going through that is it helped them get over like the fear of death and the fear of your own mortality. And that's, and some of the ba- greatest uh, philosophers that we've heard of people watching Plato, Socrates, mm-hmm. all went through this. Um, the mm-hmm. list, you're right. They were sworn to secrecy and it was women who ran it and they would have to walk from Athens to Ulysses, the, the pathway and the, the people, the, the, the community would stand on the side of the road and scream insults at them before they got to the well where they believed a meter waited for Persephone, where they started fasting before they went underground. So they went through this total humiliation of having their ego tested by walking that whole way. It was like 12 miles or something to the well, having people, and they you didn't just sign up for it. You had to do phase one first in the springtime. And then you had to wait the whole summer to come back in the fall to do the big the big shebang. And, um, and so you are literally, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, uh, I, 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 there are people I know who've done, uh, ayahuasca who kind of go through that experience too, where all of a sudden they like, um, I remember one of our students at AYA did it and he came back and he said the most profound thing he realized is that happy or sad, it's all coming from the same place and it's your perception Mm -hmm. of reality. And he said that was the most profound thing to him. And in this, uh, journey was that, Oh my God, my happy times and my sad times are all coming from the same place. And that's me and my perception. Mm. So I have to change my perception because it's within my power. And we know that, like, I think we know that when we study yoga and we study healing, but do we really know that? You know, do we really know that? There's a difference between knowing something. It's like an integrative. Yeah. An integrative knowing. You can know it on a mental, philosophical level, but do you actually know it viscerally? And I think that's what the yoga practice helps us. It takes your theory. And that's part of the, um, yeah, I think about it. I'm, I'm, I'm now just thinking of like teacher training and, and Samkhya, you know, the, the path, which is, uh, that's the word they, they use too with Ayurveda is, uh, um, that the, the practice of yoga itself, you know, like the, with the eight limbs and everything like that, it's designed to take theory and put it into practice. Yes. Because without the practice, you did, I mean, what's the point of just knowing the stuff and you're not going to do anything with it? It's like you have to like integrate it within your body and, that's and, like- and integrate it within your, within, your, within your life. And you understand the concepts viscerally instead of just, you know, being able to, to spat it's out fancy words. Like and, you, and you can tell, too, like you... If you start to read energy for a while, and I'm sure you know this too, Emmy, it's like you can kind of tell when someone has integrated something versus they're just talking out their ass about it. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, no, this yeah. person, like, actually, they they know it. Like, you they can tell. It's like, there's a, there's a, <laughs> see, there's a different feeling within them when they, they got it. You know what I mean? Whatever that is, whatever that piece of knowledge is, when it clicks and you get it, you're, you show up different. Well, that's yes. why Guruji used to say 99% practice, 1% theory. And apparently right. um, before, apparently before the white people used to start coming over to India, apparently it was 70% practice, 30% theory, but all the white hippies that came over in like the sixties, all they want to do was smoke pot, drink coffee and talk to Guruji about philosophy. Right. And so he got so fed up. He, he changed it to 99% practice. It's because, of us white the numbers. it's because of us white people that he changed. He was like, no, you practice. Like, exactly <laughs> down, get on your mat you know and that's what the yeah. yoga does really is like any tradition where it's ashtanga or anything it's about like internalizing internalizing yeah. those teachings and bringing them into your into your visceral body into that full understanding coming down into the body and there was something that we were talking about in class today too like the, the importance of 
of coming into your coming into your body, which is where you know I think all the, the yoga traditions help us with um, in you know how we all have our own coping mechanisms, and a lot of those coping me- coping me- mechanisms have to do with escapism. And I mean, I, I know you probably know all about you know the the coping mechanisms of like the addictions and everything that we go through to to numb and to escape because. Like our body just doesn't feel like this safe space to inhabit or this world doesn't feel like a safe space to inhabit. Like if I was to go into my body, it's like, no, I don't want to feel those things. I want to numb. I want to prevent. I'm trying to actually prevent that from happening. So we establish those coping mechanisms to get us out of our body so that we don't have to actually internalize or look at the things. And then, you know, when you do get on your spiritual practice, and you have to ground yourself and come back into the body. And then, yes, yeah, like, and then you have to work through all those different layers that are telling you that your body's not safe, you know? Yeah. And I think, uh, too, I think too, with addictions is we create this environment within our bodies that is toxic and our souls can't come down. And so we spend a lot of time hanging out up here And I know for me with food, what's so difficult with the food is because I used it as escapism and I also used it to ground. So it's Mm. like here I was creating this toxic environment in my body with food, turning to food to cope and to manage and to escape. And I would create this toxic environment in my body and I would leave. I would leave, but you know what I'm talking about. And then later on at night before bed, I just felt so far away and the food would make me feel grounded so that I could fall asleep. And it was just this vicious, vicious process. Um, so yeah, just, it, it's just, it's so eye opening and, and to, with yoga, um, I'm learning that I just have to show up. I just have to show up just like in my recovery program. I just show up. I bring my body and my mind will follow. And it's really hard because my ego keeps telling me that I should be farther along. I should be farther along. I should be farther along. No, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. I'm just showing up. And it. what I love about yoga is that it's a new practice every day. It's a new practice. Now we begin the practice of yoga. Now we begin the practice of yoga. But my ego is constantly trying to put me in this frame of mind that I need to build on the practice I did before. And it's like, no, I I can progress, but it's not successive. It's new every day. It's new. Now I begin my practice. And, and that's really taking quite a bit of time to to integrate and embody. Like, like Bryce was saying earlier, you can understand these things intellectually and philosoph- philosophically, but until they really embody and integrate um, on a cellular level, that ego is really going to have um, the upper hand. And even with Bryce, like I got Bryce today. She's been doing this for 17 years and I got her. (laughs) The whole time I was like making my list of people to go with me to the military training. (laughs) 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 Um, You know, but. but, And and I was just going to say, now, now I practice yoga. You know, that is in essence, the, the very first yoga sutra. This Yoga Sutra 1.1, the first thing he says is now, here now, the yoga begins. And there's something to that, you know? It's like that understanding of now, like here it is now, now it begins. And the second sutra, Sri Swami Satitananda's commentary, he's like, if you understand the second sutra, you don't need the rest of them. (laughs) But then we study the rest of them because even though the second sutra is like understanding the fluctuations of the mind, we obviously don't totally understand that. So we have to go forward. <laughs> the rest of them. I love that's the yes. ending. So very simple, just very simple. Um, I will tell this story. Um, 
you know, in and out about the, the, the response. I don't know. I feel like the need to tell the story. Todd tells the story all the time, you know, and in Ashtanga, we are big on backbending and I'm not talking about just a basic backbend. Like you end up catching your leg standing up like a, you know, ca- catching your thighs. Sometimes it's an intense backbend. And the, Todd always tells the story. The first time he had to catch, we call it catching. Um, he was in the Lakshmi Puram before it was moved to Gokulam. The, the shala was in Lakshmi Puram. It was a smaller, much smaller shala. And he heard Guruji speaking to Sharat uh, in Kannada and pointing to Todd. Point, and, and so Todd knew that he was uh, giving Sharat some instruction. And so Todd's doing his backbend and Sharat comes up to help him. And he, he felt Sharat grab Todd's arms. And he knew just at that moment what was about to happen, that Sharat was going to pull him in to catch his legs. And hanging backwards, Todd said just instinctually, he just screamed this loud, no, like really loud. And Sharat, because, you know, you're, the head's right beside you, Sharat whispered in Todd's ear, yes. And then pulled <laughs> yes <laughs> but and that's and that's the thing too when you get into these deep potent lineages that i think oftentimes is bypassed in our modern culture you know for Shrat to be able to maintain that calmness when his student is having a panic attack he can do that because he's been through it many times himself before um, I can be a because there are times my 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 general personality as a human being is not to be a hard ass. I'm I'm pretty. I like to laugh. I like to make jokes. But in a mice room, especially in a mice room, you have to be very tough and you have to like be that anchor to keep the student that yes, keep the student when they're having their you know come to Jesus moment. Uh, you know on the mat and um and it, the only reason you're able to do that is because you you know. You know the path they're on right now. You know what's happening. You know the the, and you know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And you have to be that anchor to help them keep moving. Even if you have to crawl, keep moving forward. What's the Winston Churchill quote? Uh, when you're going through hell, keep going. You know, um, and um, um, and so and that, and I think that, that a lot of that is lost in our society. And that's the one thing I love about traditional yoga is that it forces you to be a student for a very long time. And one thing I've said this before, I know, Cindy, you can probably speak to this, you know, Emmy talking about like the ego wanting to progress, progress. Well, first of all, you're always taking three steps forward and two steps back. So every person is constantly yo-yoing. One thing you get like a bind, you'll get a bind and then you'll have that bind for six months, and then you'll lose it again for like a month because the body's always constantly shifting, especially when you start adding in more postures, the body's having to like recalibrate itself. But another thing too, with the whole progression thing, just so people understand and feel better about this, we often say the easiest people to teach are the beginner students and the advanced students because both the beginner student and the advanced student know that they know nothing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, the advanced student knows that they know nothing too, you know, and so it, it becomes, it's a more humbling process. It's the intermediate student. That's the asshole. No. <laughs> oh, that think they know everything, but no, you know, and so, and so, you know, when that ego creeps up, just be like, no, you know, even in the most, most advanced of people will. And I, I find that with athletes too, you, you have these athletes that made it super far in their athletic careers. And a lot of them, walk away pretty humbled you know by by their the friction through their body and the and the the the, um, resistance we have a lot of athletes at aya like big time athletes and they're some of the most banked up people we work with and there's a humility there yeah and there's a uh speaking of the the ego this has come up a few times there's a book uh that i'm uh, that I've been reading, I can't remember, but it's something about higher consciousness. It was like one that was written maybe like in the 1970s, but it has one of my favorite things about the ego. And it's like, it, it, it's not that you're trying to kill the ego. You're just trying to unemploy the ego. <laughs> I love that. So that it doesn't have anything else to do. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to just kind of unemploy it. And so it can sit back and not feel like it has to grab onto things and create things and create situations and create drama and create protective mechanisms to 
you know, to do your internal work so that uh, you're basically just trying to make the ego jobless, giving it right. less of a job to do. When my, I, I, I don't know, that just really, I, I don't know, that. That, that interpretation just felt good to me, you know? When I notice my ego, oftentimes I'll say, okay, thanks for the resistance. Thanks mm -hmm. for this resistance. You know, you think about like people watching right now, if that confuses you, think about like when you do like weight resistant training with weights, you know, that's, it's a resistance you're creating and that's what the ego is giving you that resistance. So, you know, days when your ego is trying, I mean, my ego is trying to, con trying to convince me that, that my body was too, too sore, too tired when I was perfectly fine. And so when that happens, it's like, okay, thanks for giving me the resistance to now get up and have a, and have a mm -hmm. proper practice, you know, and that's, that's, that's the point of, of living this human life to have that, those opposing forces to have the, and what, what more of a, we talk about opposing forces a lot, especially in Ashtanga yoga. And what more of an opposing force is there? You're an eternal soul living in a mortal body. So on one side mm -hmm. of your existence, you're, you'll never die. The other side of your existence has an expiration date. So you're looking at a complete opposing force just in the expression of being you, you know, and, and that's, that's the, the beauty that we get to experience. And as you probably hear my dog shaking off over there, but even the animals have this, even, you know, all, all beings, things of life experience the fragility of life, even when life actually isn't that fragile because we are, we are eternal souls. So I know we're getting a little over an hour now. Is there anything you guys like want to close out with for our awesome viewers who are going to be doing this awesome 60 day challenge with us coming up very soon? Take, take a lot of time to do um, self care and pampering. Go get yourself a massage. Um, go to a salt room. I don't know if, if you guys have salt rooms in your area, but a friend of mine was telling me that she just went in and had um, this salt float. And that sounds amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Um, but just do a, do a lot of just lighthearted, um, fun things. Because, you know, that this, like Cindy was saying earlier, we can't constantly stay in the shadow work, like we have to come up for air, we have to come up to breathe. And so, you know, between now and then, especially since the energies of the last few weeks have been pretty intense. Um, I think that doing something lighthearted and taking a lot of time to do self care and pampering would be would be good. Yeah, celebrate your successes too, along the lines yes. of that. Don't forget to celebrate yourself with showing up and the little steps that you take, because then that's what helps to build the momentum to keep you going. Because if, yeah, if you focus so much, oh, I'm not getting far, I'm not doing this, so you, well, you show it up and that's something. And and my teachers always told me that no effort ever goes unnoticed, ever. Like any effort that you make toward your path and on your mat it's going to take you somewhere, even if it feels like it doesn't. So even if you're showing up and and you don't feel like you had a good practice, just celebrate the fact that you showed up. So just don't don't forget to celebrate your your successes. That's an excellent point. And another thing too, um, with the shadow work challenge, there there is quite a bit to do, quite a bit to select from. Um, you don't have to answer every question. You don't have to do every activity. You don't have to complete it all to have gotten something done. Um, a long time ago, I changed my to-do list to a ta-da list so that even if I check off just one thing, it's worthy of celebration. And I love that. I never write to-do anymore. I always write ta-da. So... Maybe you could apply that to your shadow work too. Like maybe one day you're just feeling exceptionally heavy and emotional and things are just really difficult and you only answer one question in the journaling prompts. Check that off as a ta-da. You know, you showed up for yourself. You answered a question when things are really, really tough for you. You know, like Cindy says, celebrate. Celebrate your successes, however small. It's so important. I'm glad you said that, Emmy, because the journaling prompts, that's all they are is prompts. 
you know, and I, we only put them out there because so many people go to journal and they don't know what to journal about. They feel lost and overwhelmed with their emotions or what they're experiencing. And so these questions are just to kind of get your brain going, get your thoughts going, and then you take it from there. You, you don't have to answer every single question. And as I said, on with Aquarius Rising Africa this morning, we were talking about it. If you are someone that feels like you have to do every single thing on the list to be worthy, well, there's your shadow work right there. Ta-da! Speaking of ta-da, there it is. There's your shadow work right there. You know, it's not, and that's why I give, and this and this, this 60 day is going to be way more selections than a 30 day. There's going to be multiple different exercises to pick from you know, multiple different things to figure out what works for you. And, and I, and, you know, for, for us, for Cindy, myself and Emmy, we have our, the way we work our shadow work because we've been doing it for a very long time. Um, but I selected a bunch of different modalities because it's a chance for you to experiment so that you under, you can feel, be in your body, right? As we've been saying, be in your property and figure out what works for you right now. And saying that what works for you right now might not be the same thing that works for you a year from now. You know? Um, so I really like, I really like that you incorporated different choices. I, I, I would like to say something about um, your astrological makeup. So there are fixed signs, there are mutable signs, and there are cardinal signs. People with fixed signs will do really, really, with a, a predominantly fixed chart, will do really well with the same thing in a, in a repeated routine. People who have predominantly cardinal signs in their chart would do well with um, frequently setting a new goal, frequently um, re-looking at something so that it's fresh. And people will, people with mutable um, signs in their chart will do well with changing things up because they really get bored. Doing the same thing over and over can be draining for someone with uh, mutable energy in their chart. So, you know, take into consideration your own energetic makeup when you're looking at your shadow work and the exercises that you're going to choose. You know, if, if you can take your chart and, and look at the different signs that all of your planets are in and figure out what your um, quality of energy is that's predominant for you, you'll know better how to address setting up a plan going forward. That's awesome. Yeah, for sure. I was like, ooh, I, I bet a lot of Ashtanga people have fixed signs. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ding, 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 no. <laughs> so, and I will say too, you know, on that note, like I've incorporated a lot of bar into my uh, practice every week. And um, Cindy helped me with that. So did Chris. And it really like changed my practice because I needed a different perspective, a different for myself. I'm not saying that's the same for everybody, but for me, because I've been doing the same practice for over a decade, bringing that bar into it changed my body and changed the way my body responded to, I became even more connected to Mola Bunda, even more connected to Uriana Bunda and understanding it from a different perspective. And that's, a, and that, that, that will happen too. And so absolutely, there's not, there's no one size fits all you guys. There's no one size fits all. Don't feel like you have to fit the mold. Um, we're all special little butterflies that have our own special way of doing things. And so as long as you're working on yourself then there are things to learn. Yeah, and yeah, and the uh, I just turned 50. And body is always changing when you get older. So if you are a little bit more on the, the older than the last, the last half of your life know that uh, you may have to move your body differently. Um, weights help light weights because you need muscle, you need to muscle tone. Um, so yeah, uh, just keep that keep that in mind that as your body ages, you'll need to different things. Um, your body will respond to things differently with the food and all that stuff too. So I incorporated there yourself some of the grace and the space to to yeah. figure those things out. I work with two pound weights myself, and it's really helped my um, practice because what was happening for me is teaching as well. Um, the worst thing you can ever do for your yoga practice is become a teacher <laughs> um, mm -hmm. when you're adjusting people all day. And so I incorporated the two pound weights in with my bar and that's helped me be a better teacher. It's helped my body and my practice because and I'm 
almost 40. And so that's given, and I was saying to Helen Emmy this morning, I feel like I'm better shape at 40 than I was at 25. And, um, and there mm -hmm. is going to be a link I've shared to another bar, another bar teacher besides Marnie Alton. She, Marnie Alton's my favorite, but there's another bar I'm putting up that, um, she uses like two pound weights and I put that optional. Now, if you don't have weights, you can grab like soup cans, water bottles. Um, I know Marnie Alton laughs and says you can even use wine bottles and you don't want to drop those suckers. Like that'll <laughs> really make you like <laughs> use the resistance. So, um, hey, and, and bring back those ankle weights, man. Oh, I, I know. Ankle weights no. and I use your ankle weights from the 1980s and the 1990s. <laughs> bring them back. They're great for your butt. Marty also um, uses them and she has a, and a, mm -hmm. a wrist weight. She has videos where she has a cut. So absolutely. And I mean, I even put like guys on this template. I even have some James Fonda videos I put on there. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Richard Simmons is coming back too, because Sunday fun day, a lot of the Sundays are really you trying to have fun. It's okay to do a Richard mm -hmm. Simmons sweat into the oldies and have fun. You know, it's okay to do a Jane Fonda and laugh at the eighties hair because it's still, <laughs> a great, it's still a great workout. Yeah. right? And being human is hard, but being human is really funny too. So, you know, yeah. uh, so, and that's, and you have to, and, and that's one thing I will say before we close out with the humor. Yes. This stuff is hard. Yes. It can be emotional. Yes. Crying is really good. We're going to talk about a lot about crying and allowing yourself to cry, but Guruji Patabi Joyce, if somebody came to his shala that seemed to be extremely serious, too serious, even if there were spaces available in the Mysore room, he would say, oh, too busy, come back later. Because he wouldn't There'd be like, like two people in the room and he's like, yeah. like, oh, Jada, too busy, come back. There's no room. room. There's no room, no space. And I will say my bestie, my Ashtanga bestie, Chris, who lives up in Canada, who also helped me with the bar as well. He is one of Sherrod's most favorite students. Why? Because he's really funny. And he jokes around mm -hmm. a lot. I will tell you, we were sitting outside of that shallow one morning, dark 30. A lot of people have their headphones on. Chris had his headphones on. Someone beside him asked uh, Chris what he was listening to. And Chris said, top 40, because he likes the Selena Gomez's and that kind of stuff. And the guy beside him goes, oh, I'm listening to chanting movement. And Chris goes, good for you. And put his headphones back on. <laughs> As, Heck good yeah. For good for you. <laughs> you, know? So, um, you know, I just love it. I love it. So, uh, so yeah, so it's, uh, you know, and, and he makes sure I laugh. Like he makes sure I laugh in the shala. Just the way he reacts to the practice makes there's humor there, you know, and, um, and I, 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 I'm telling him now his first trip to India in primary series, he only did one Navasana because he said if Sharat found out, he could just play dumb. <laughs> <laughs> you're supposed to do like five. And I was like, he, and, uh, he would go into the closing room where we we're supposed to do full closing and he would just kind of take rest and leave. And Laruga, who's a pretty famous teacher was outside and, and she's like, Chris, that was fast. He goes, oh, yeah, I don't do full closing during my store. I just take rest and leave. And she goes, Chris. And he goes, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I do it like that. It's fine. You know? <laughs> like, and just having that sense of humor will get you a, a long way. And it is funny. Life, life is really, really funny. And uh, and so so laugh at yourself too. You know, laugh at yourself on your yoga mat. Laugh at yourself on in the bar stuff. Laugh at yourself doing Richard Simmons because that's, part of being human but all right you guys so this is going to be aired on thursday morning i'm hoping i'll have the template complete by saturday uh, i know emmy and i are going to be filming um on friday together so hopefully we'll have it all ready to go for saturday a week before the challenge starts and i will let don't email me for it yet i've got to get everything set up so i can make sure to get everybody's uh template uh cindy last time we had over 600 people globally doing this so so great yeah amazing Good for you good for everybody, Good for everybody. i mean every, I'm not just, i mean we have so many people participating and contributing including emmy and cindy so you guys are not just hearing from me you're hearing from a bunch of other people who work in the healing arts will say um <laughs> and giving their perspective on the on it so you get to experiment with different ideas and see how different people see this and work with you know, which modality works best for you. And so what works for you is what works for you. So, all right, you guys, we'll talk to you soon. Bye, everybody. Bye.